Hello and welcome to my channel, uh, which is for anyone who cares about language technology and other people. Uh, let's get right into it. So this is a deep dive, which means I'm going to talk for a long time and then uh, I'll get to y'all's questions. Don't worry, I see them. I'm going to stick them in my pocket for later. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the surprisingly long history of language generation or natural language generation um, and specifically things that happened before computers. So we're only going to go up to like the 1930s, 40s, because um, starting in like the 1950s, you started to get you know artificial intelligence as a field and, and things changed a little bit. Uh, but I think it's helpful to, uh, hey Luke, uh, think about, not even think about, but know about the history of the ways that people have thought about language and what they've tried to do with language because language is special. Uh, and I am personally very invested in this idea, which you can tell because I got a PhD in it. So uh, the first thing that may be surprising to some folks is the language generation, this idea of, you know, generating language either through combinations or potentially through some sort of random process uh, predates computers by a lot. And as we'll get into, um, it actually arguably is what caused computers to be an idea in the first place. Uh, so literally thousands of years this has been around and not only have people been generating language, but um, another thing that I'm going to talk about a lot is cherry picking. So cherry picking is this idea if you have a bunch of, let's say, results from your model or let's say you've run a bunch of experiments and there's like one experimental result, you're like, oh, that one's interesting. The rest of these are not so interesting. I'm just going to ignore these. You pick out like you would pick cherries from a tree, the, the good ones, the interesting ones. Um, and it's just there's always been this sort of like human filtering element in natural language generation as it's been done previous to computers. So I'm going to, as much as possible, try to fold in some things from outside of Europe, but this is not, I should say, my special speciality. So if any of you know of other uh, types of language generation, uh, particularly outside of this sort of European um, intellectual tradition, I'd love to hear about them. Um, so one example is Ifa. Ifa? Um, I don't speak Yoruba, so my apologies uh, for those of you who, who do and are, are just wincing right now. Um, and it's a divinatory practice based on a, um, you know, an oral tradition, um, which is this enormous text. And you would, based upon the, you know, the casting, select the uh, relevant text and then, you know, describe how it would be appropriate to the situation as sort of the general idea. Um, Again, date unknown, um, and there's also you know some discussion of whether or not it's you know completely Yoruba or draws on other cultures in the area, or maybe you know um, people call them, or at least scholars call them Aboriginal cultures, and I don't know if that's uh, a term that's uh, appropriate <laughs> if you if you are from that area. So again, apologies, this is not my area of specialization, but I think it's important to think about that this is not just like um, in Europe. Uh, another example, I mean, arguably uh, in the sort of realm of picking things from a corpus uh, is the I Ching, which in the US or in the West is sometimes called the Book of Changes, um, which dates from the Western Zhao. So maybe around 1000 BC, it's, it's, we don't have exact dates um, in sort of the, again, the European tradition, um, but it's a book of texts and you'd select it using randomized methods. So like um, one would be, uh, they'd be on, you know, sticks and you'd, you'd randomly pick one of the sticks using various methods. Uh, so again, you have this corpus, you are generating or selecting from it uh, for the, you know, hopefully appropriate uh, um, situation. Uh, and then another one from the Islamic world, um, Zierja. Again, I'm so sorry, I don't speak Arabic. <laughs> I'm almost certainly saying that wrong. So uh, apologies for, for mispronouncing anything. Um, it was a method of generating letters giving astrological information. Uh, and I actually learned about this from Chris Kensky, uh, a former colleague of mine, who I believe is currently at Microsoft Research. So Chris, if you're watching, hi. Um, and this is uh, an example. What side is it on? This is a side of what it looks like, right? So you, you'd have this, this figure and you'd generate or pick the letters based on um, your, your particular, um, astrological time, date, whatever it was that you were looking at. So uh, different ways, again, outside of the European tradition of randomly selecting texts um, based on other factors in the world. Uh, and again, this is quite ancient, right? This is, uh, this is very old, <laughs> certainly not in the last 10 years. 
Uh, and there's, like I mentioned, there's probably a bunch of stuff that I just don't know about yet. Um, again, my my own intellectual training has very much been in the European tradition. So um, even though I am, you know, I'm curious and I try to try to learn more, I know there's a lot of stuff around the world that I just have not been exposed to. So if you know of any, please, I'd, I'd love to learn more. All right, now we're going to focus a little bit more in on the European uh, tradition. So uh, in the 1200s, and you'll remember this uh, very similar looking uh, thing from the Arabic world in the uh, you know the thousands. So right around that, uh, and Ramon Ramon perhaps Lowell was I believe he was from Majorca Majorca. Um, so perhaps some inspiration there. Uh, came up with this idea of a, a thinking machine is what it's commonly discussed, um, although. From having read uh, sort of about his worldview, um, I think that he probably didn't think the machines were thinking. Um, the this happens kind of a lot around language, particularly in the Christian tradition, um, that there's this sort of like universal language that, you know, contains truth and correctness. Um, sometimes you'll hear people talk about Adamic or Adamic or the language of Adam. Um, there's this Christian myth where everyone used to speak the same language and then they wanted to build a really big building and God got angry and then he created a bunch of other languages. So that has informed a lot of, you know, in the Christian intellectual tradition, thinking about language. Um, and this is related to that, right? He wanted to create this universal language that had pure truth in it and use that to convert things to Christianity. I believe he was a friar. Um, and his, his concept was that there's a limited number of concepts in the world um, and therefore a limited number of combinations of them. So if you just keep combining these limited number of concepts and these limited number of combinations, you will arrive at pure truth um, was sort of his, his general idea. Um, and I think he also um, died as a result of trying to convert some people who didn't want to be converted. So clearly he was very um, uh, driven <laughs> by this particular uh, particular idea. And you can see this example here, nope, on this side, uh, has a bunch of like Latin um, words that you would, you'd connect to each other. Uh, and then in the 1600s, so now we're getting into, you know, the Renaissance, um, you had uh, George Philip, Philippe, probably Philip, um, Arstorfer, Arstorfer, again, I don't speak German, apologies for saying that correctly. And this is the, this is the um, picture that was on the, the, the thumbnail. So if you're waiting for it, where is it? Here it is. Um, also, I think I might've said 1615 on the thumbnail. And I think it was in fact, 1651. So at this point we've moved um, into more of a sort of rationalist enlightenment sort of way of thinking about things. Um, and his aim was not, you know, to create this universal language to, you know, spread Christianity. It was to teach children. Um, if you're familiar with German, it's a language that's very, um, rich in word pieces that you can combine that you'd call, call morpheme. So the joke is like for non-German speakers, the joke is that German words are often very long because they're made up of lots of little segments combined together. Um, so the, the thing that he was teaching was children how to combine, you know, words and word segments and letters into words. Um, and he created this idea of a, I'm not going to try and say it, but basically a word building machine um, that lets you combine, you know, so it's like a, a set of wheels and you'd rotate the wheels and you'd combine the words and you'd read them out and you'd be like, oh, that's a word um, to teach this idea that there are bits of words that you can recombine and reposition. Um, so that's what that is. There you <laughs> uh, that's what that is uh, in, in about the 1600s. So again, we're in this idea of combining things um, and not quite as much randomness. Although I suppose if you built it as like a roulette wheel, you could have uh, quite a bit of randomness in there, uh, but it was more combinatorics, not quite so much the randomness, but we'll see those combined in just a second. Um, and again, on the, the combinatorics. So in uh, 1677, John Peter, uh, who I believe was English, but I could be wrong on that. Um, had this idea of making Latin verses by, um, you know, combining pieces, right? So Latin has some properties that um, English, for example, does not have that a lot of, um, I would say, intellectuals <laughs> who were taught using Latin as the sort of, you know, academic language in the way that English is more or less today, um, believed was, you know, very desirable. Um, and one of those things is that it's, you know, pretty, um, uh, syntactically, it's actually a little bit much, it's much freer than English, uh, but it tends to have a very sort of like rigid structure. Um, 
That's a very vague way of putting it. Know that Latin and English are not super <laughs> interoperable in this way. Um, and the idea of this, this verb, not verb, this uh, verse generator is that you'd have, you know, a set of types of words um, and they had to have, you know, particular metrical quality. So the stress and length of the word had to be a specific way. Um, but as long as you had, you know, a bunch of adjectives that were dactyls, a bunch of adverbs that were iams, you could, you know, randomly select one of them from each of these these combinations and end up with something that looked like correct Latin verse because it was very templatic. Um, again, would probably not have worked quite as well in, say, the Germanic uh, tradition of, you know, early Germanic or, or Celtic tradition of, of producing poetry, but for the Latin tradition, it worked quite well. Uh, and there was actually a physical one built um, in the 1830s by John Clark in England, and that's that one. <laughs> Uh, that sort of like box thing. Um, so again, this is before computers, but we still have machines that can generate language. So uh, I just think it's cool. Uh, and going uh, back from the physical machine that generates language, but forward from the idea of the verse generator, um, so you were seeing the combinatorics, not quite so much the randomness. Here we have both. Um, so this is the engine from uh, Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels. If you're not familiar with it, it's a satirical fantasy novel, I guess I would call it, um, about uh, Gulliver, who's a, a sailor, and he travels around and um, you know interacts with various people. Um, most people know it for the, the Lilliputians, like very small people, and they tie him down by the hair, and then he, he does a bunch of colonialism. Anyway, uh, one of the ideas that he had uh, that he talked about in one of his societies that was like the very, you know, society was supposed to be oh, like, oh, they're so advanced and fancy um, is the engine. So you had a bunch of pieces of wood with words written on them, and then they were just randomly shuffled. Um, and, you know, someone would look over them and anything that sounded good from this random shuffling would just be written down and recorded. So you have the combinatorics, right? You have the words, you have the randomness, they're being shuffled. Um, and then you have that sort of like cherry picking human filtering of like, oh, this bit looks good. Oh, this bit looks good. Um, and again, mm, Depending on who you talk to, sometimes people will talk about other things as being like the first idea of a computer, but this is one that comes up a lot. So this desire to generate language has always been super foundational to our, you know, desire to build computers. And obviously, well, I was gonna say, obviously computers don't look like this right now. <laughs> Not the internals, but certainly some of the stuff we're doing with them. Um, yeah, and so I just want to make that point again that this sort of human filtering component, this cherry picking has pretty much always been there when we talk about natural language generation. Um, and I would argue is very much still there today. Um, related to this, so this is, I promise this gets uh, beyond just the thought experiment, uh, is this idea of the uh, infinite monkey theorem. And this comes from early work in probability theory. Um, and it's, it's often credited to Emile Borel um, in his uh, Mechanics of Statistics and Irreversibility. <laughs> uh, and uh, this was coming around the same time that things like Markov chains were first invented, uh, or the idea of sort of like a, a Markov machine, which if you're familiar with old school NLP, you'll be very familiar with. Um, and three years before uh, Saussure's course in general linguistics, which is, you know, one of the early structuralist linguist works, which is what a lot of current linguistic literature is built on, um, was published posthumously. So I believe Saussure was actually, um, I don't actually know that they interacted at all, but I believe that Saussure was lecturing while this was happening. So this was sort of like in this, um, this sort of milieu of, okay, language has structure um, and we can combine things randomly. And the idea of the infinite monkey theorem, let me actually say what it is, is that if you had infinite monkeys on infinite typewriters and they were randomly generating things, eventually you'd get the complete works of Shakespeare, right? So, um, and the, this was to demonstrate the point that in a truly random system, if the system is large enough, every extremely impossible thing not impossible, every extremely improbable thing is going to happen. Um, 
which I think tends to be fairly unintuitive for folks. So it's like if you've ever taken a statistics class and you have that uh, experiment where um, one group, you know, flips a coin and writes down what it is and the other group just sort of tries to randomly come up with what it would be. Um, and then the teacher comes back in the room and it's like, oh, it's that one because you had a lot of improbable events in it, right? You had like eight heads in a row, but the random group didn't, right? They were like, that doesn't look random. I should like change it up a little bit to make it look more random. Anyway, so it was to try and help people build this intuition. It was very much a thought experiment. Um, however, <laughs> uh, monkeys are, are not in fact random. I would argue that biological entities pretty much aren't. There is some randomness in you know chemical processes to a smaller degree, but certainly behaviorally, I would say randomness is not a trait of, <laughs> of behavior. Um, somebody did it. So this was in 2002. So, Computers existed, obviously, but I thought this was just a fun experiment to share. Um, and at the um, Pangenton Zoo Environmental Park in the UK, they put a, a computer in with a bunch of monkeys. Um, and they, in fact, did not do things randomly. So you have something like uh, this, which a little bit hard to read, but it's S, G, S, Q, Q, A, Q, 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 A. Um, and eventually the, the typewriter was destroyed. Um, and there's also, interestingly, uh, the experimenters reported a, a social component as well. So some of the, the monkeys were, um, you know, uh, interested in it because other monkeys were interested in it. Ah, social factors are important when it comes to communication and uh, behavior. Uh, so that's sort of the whole thing. So, you know, combining from uh, randomly selecting from a small number of things to combining smaller pieces to adding randomness to that to only having randomness right and combining even smaller pieces and eventually getting you know with enough cherry picking right because you still have to sit there and look at everything the monkeys write and find the shakespeare um eventually getting something kind of useful uh and i'll add this uh oh i gotta say this out loud <laughs> this quote from Voorhees? I'm pretty sure it's Voorhees. Please don't come for me. Um, for every sensible line or accurate fact, there would be millions of meaningless cacophonies, verbal farragios, mm, and babblings, everything. But all the generations of mankind could pass before the dizzying shelves, shelves that obliterate the day and on which chaos lies, ever reward them with a tolerable page. Um, so this is the idea of a library that has everything, every potential combination, everything. Um, and he's saying like, hey, if there's enough noise uh, and you have a person sitting there and looking through it, eventually they're going to find something that is rewarding to them. Uh, so to sum up, I'm going to avoid editorializing too much on <laughs> the current state in NLP uh, and the relationships there. Um, we really want to generate language. We really want to have something non-human that produces human looking language. It's just a thing people like and have liked cross-culturally for as long as we've got history on it. Um, the reasons to do this, uh, the why you would spend time on this task and trying to figure it out has to do with people's specific worldviews and goals. So um, is it, you know, divinatory? Does it come from your religious uh, background? Are you motivated from that? Are you trying to teach somebody something? Um, are you trying to, to demonstrate a point, particularly a lot of the thought experiments? The reasons people do it have to do with their social environment. Um, and we sort of have this shift from focusing on randomized selections to focusing on combinatorics to focusing on randomized combinatorics, just sort of like it's a very high level overview, which is sort of where we are now. Um, and there's always been, you know, cherry picking post hockery. So post hoc means after the fact and like doing something after the fact of the generation to, you know, select the thing that looks the best or most interesting to you or to pique people's interest. Um, and I wouldn't say it's necessarily a bad thing, but it is an important part of the history of natural language generation, and I would argue is very much still a part of natural language generation. Um, and, you know, there's uh, there's this saying, there's nothing new under the sun, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, particularly when it comes to language, we humans are really interested in language. And um, we've thought about it a lot. <laughs> and a lot of people have said a lot of things. Uh, and it is likely that if, if something that seems new comes up, uh, someone else has already talked about it. Is just as a general rule. Uh, so 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at the chat now and answer questions. Um, thank you for joining. And if you would like, uh, I'd really appreciate it if you'd comment below if you know of any other types of historical natural language generation. This is, you know, things that I knew about or that, you know, when I was talking with, again, I mentioned I talked with Chris Ketsky about this quite a bit. So, um, and he did work on, on sort of natural language generation and also music generation as well. Um, I also didn't talk about narrative generation, which is uh, generating stories. I was sort of focusing at a, at a lower um, level in terms of structure, um, but that is a rich area as well. And I believe there is a workshop on narrative generation coming up in July at uh, NACL. I think it's NACL that's in Seattle. So if you're interested in that, I check out those workshop proceedings. Let me look at the chat uh, if you are popping out now. Thanks so much for joining. I hope this was interesting. Um, I, I like history. <laughs> and I especially like history when it has to do with language technology. So I hope you also do. All right. Uh, oh, it's just folks saying hi. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, Luke. Hey, Alexander. Hey, uh, Multi-Solutions Nicaragua. Nice to, <laughs> nice to see you uh, and Khalid and uh, Docking AI. Uh, it says lol, so presumably at some point in there. All right, and I'm going to take a big sip of coffee and let y'all um, enter any questions if you have them. Um, otherwise, if nobody's got any questions, I will uh, see you on Thursday. So the sort of structure of my streams for the next little bit is going to be on Tuesday. I'll do a deep dive, so sort of like this. Um, the next one... Uh, you all actually voted for this uh, on the on my channel's community tab, so thank you so much for your input there. Um, for the next one, I'm thinking about maybe adversarial uses of NLP and sort of like types of harm to think about, because um, it's, you know, it's just something I've been thinking a lot about lately, and I think a lot of people have, and it's helpful to have, you know, framework. I like framework. Uh, and then on Thursday, we're going to do a week in review, except for this one, it's going to be several weeks in review because I haven't, uh, I haven't streamed recently. Uh, and woo, there's a lot in there. I have no idea how long that one's going to be, but maybe quite a while. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, Alexander says, uh, Khalid has a question. Go ahead. Uh, wasn't the iPod shuffle also made more random because it didn't look random enough to customers? Yeah, that's very possible. Um, cause we don't usually like things that are truly random, right? So a truly random iPod shuffle would at some point play the same song a hundred times in a row. Um, and that's not generally what people want. So, uh, oh, Docking wants to know about the page of Shakespeare written by an actual monkey. Yeah, let's see if I can, uh, avoid exiting <laughs> my, uh, uh, presentation. Oh, that was what the, the laughing was about. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. All right, I'll wait for Khalid's question. Khalid, I'm sorry if I'm saying it wrong. Uh, please feel free to correct me. Uh, Khalid wants to know, can I use the CRF entity instructor that is used in Raza in other projects? Um, so for those of you who don't know, I used to work at Raza. Um, you should be able to, mm, I would double check the imports and the licensing on that, but Raza itself is uh, Apache 2.0, so you should be able to, um, from a licensing standpoint, do that. But I, again, I would double check the, the entity extractor specifically. Um, and yes, you should be able to use it. The joys of open source. All right. so. I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, I hope you found this uh, interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, like I said, I, I really like the history of language and language technology. Um, I think it's, I think it's a cool thing and I hope you agree. So thank you so much for joining today. Um, I hope you had a uh, enjoyable time. Uh, we'll be back on Thursday for a little bit more of a news roundup and it's, ooh, it's going to be long <laughs> uh, and maybe a little bit less fun and lighthearted than this one, but I could use some fun and lighthearted right now. Uh, and I will see you then. And if you have any other questions or comments, you know, comments are open. Um, I do take a look at them. Uh, yeah. And I hope to see you on Thursday or otherwise next Tuesday for another deep dive. All right. I'll talk to you later. Bye.